Brittany Barnes. Um, I work in IBM Security, and I've been a software developer th with them for coming up on five years now. Um, I graduated from Virginia Tech, and I have a BS in Computer Science and a BS in Applied and Discrete Mathematics. Hi, my name is Morgan Carroll. I'm a senior cloud engineer. I've been with IBM for about five years as well. Um, before that, I got my bachelor's in computer science at the University of Texas at Tyler. And then um, a couple of years ago, I got my master's in computer science from Texas State University. Hi, I'm Dixie. Um, I'm based out of Austin, Texas. I've been at IBM for about two years now. Uh, I do not have a computer science degree. I actually have a bachelor of science in education. Um, prior to college, I was in the military. I was a radar technician for about five years, and then I went to school, got my degree in education, and taught as a science teacher, um, ran code clubs, and fell in love with coding, and here I am now, front-end developer at IBM. So I have the opportunity like to work with Cyber Day for Girls. I, I'm the site lead for that in Austin, Texas, so we reach out to local middle school girls, and we teach them a about cybersecurity and we show them that women are in that field. So that was one of the things I really liked about IBM because they gave me like some free time to actually explore those interests and, and work in that area as well. And just like with open source coding, um, there's a coalition we could join and now I'm in the open source community. So I, I think IBM is so big and so broad. That was one of the things that led me to it. Yeah, one of the sweetest things is when the girls will say, Oh, I think I can do it because, you know, she looks like me or I, I never expected that and I didn't see anyone working in that field. And this is something I want to do one day. So it, it's, it's awesome to see them seeing us come to talk to them and then they think I can do this, too. I would like to see more women doing other things, you know, outside of design, outside of front end development. Um, we do have some back end engineers who are women um, on different time zones, uh, but I feel like an open source as a whole, as a community, I don't know, have you guys had a lot of experience with women in the field or have you worked with other women in open source? I haven't so much. Um, I've Most of the people that I worked with, I think, if not all, were men. Um, I had a mentor who was helping me through my first um, commit, I remember, and he was a man and then the, the guys that I was talking to, so all men, um, just but that was just for this specific project i think it would be interesting to see like if there's a way to find you know open source projects that are focused and i don't even know if this is a thing you know focused on diversity like if i want to be part of a diverse project is there a place i can go to do that or is it just up to us to make that diversity ourselves i like i like that you brought that mm -hmm. up i think i think that is part of it i think you know well, first of all, community members should be inviting other people outside of the community to join. You know, there's so much untapped talent out there, um, you know, fresh learners who are just in school um, learning something new and uh, new technology uh, who are getting introduced, senior people who maybe have never done open source or want to switch to something else to gain some more experience. Um, and then just people who are super experienced and have so much to contribute. I think, you know, as community members, we should be looking and reaching out to people and saying, hey, anybody can do this. You can do this. We want you here. Even if you're just learning, we want you here and contributing. Yeah, and I think it's about breaking that barrier because even as us, for as women, as we had to break into like these male dominated fields, new open source developers, they kind of have to break into these new communities. Um, I know I joined one and it was a small, long running, close knit open source community. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult for me because they were really close and tight knit and I felt kind of scared at first to ask them questions. So I know when I made my first contribution, you had a minimum number of pull requests that you had to get. And being new to the whole experience, I had about 75% of them and I couldn't get the last one that I needed. And I waited like a week and I was so worried. I was like, how am I going to get this? I'm going to have to talk to someone. I'm going to bother them. Um, because I, I felt like it was it was going to bother them since they were so close and, you know, they weren't really talking about the small um, pieces of it, which is just reviews. So I finally worked up the courage and I sent them an email 
you had to send email in this community because they didn't have Slack or anything new. It was just the newsletter blast. So that in its own was another hurdle for me because I thought, okay, I'm sending an email. This feels way more official than it should. But I sent it out basically. And it was so much more casual than I was expecting. The team was very welcoming and, and it actually spurred another discussion where we brought up that if you're making like a smaller, straightforward change, then maybe we would lower the pull request count. And it was because I was new and bringing up these new topics to the team that we we made some change happen. Um, whereas they had been in it the whole time, they were already familiar with it. So even just having one fresh new perspective, it's really interesting to see how it changes the community like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, my first open source project, I definitely was super shy. I didn't want to ask questions. I thought maybe, you know, if I ask this, everyone's gonna be like, oh, shouldn't you know that you're working on this project? Like, uh, are, are, are you dumb? Like that, that was my irrational thinking. Um, and then it took me a couple of months to finally get out of break out of my shell. And I started asking questions in Slack and Discord within emails. And then I realized there are no stupid questions because if you have that question, someone else probably has that question too. Um, and then everybody in my personal experience so far has been super helpful in answering my questions, big or small. Um, and and usually in open source communities want to be helpful. They want you to, you know, learn and grow and contribute. So don't be shy. I mean, we've already gone through it, but anybody else going through the process, thinking about going through the process, um, yeah, ask all the questions. That means there's an opportunity for a documentation update because other people are going to have that question too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah that's exactly what I was going to mention. Yeah, the documentation. <laughs> I think we're all thinking the same thing because like, you yes. know, like, you know, people think if you're contributing to open source, like I've got to go add like a whole new feature or something like, no, it you usually have to start out with something simple. And for me, that was mm -hmm. documentation because mm -hmm. I was so nervous. I was like, I can't do this. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, I shouldn't think that way. We all think that way. But like, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start with the documentation, like this one simple thing. I wanted to do more than that. But I was like, this is just something you know, reading the documentation and understanding it is going to help me understand the project and being a fresh set of eyes on the documentation is going to show me like, okay, if me as a new user, if I'm reading the documentation and I see something that's missing, that's a good opportunity for another, um, another contribution. So yeah, the documentation is always a great place to start. I love documentation. new developers feel like they're not super experienced everybody has a talent everybody has a skill and everybody has something to bring to the table whether it's translations or accessibility design uh, documentation um what what do you call technical writing yeah technical writers mm -hmm. everybody has a skill and everybody can be a valuable member of a team if they cho choose to work on that project yeah, and the variability of your contributions, it really makes the experience as hard as you want it to be unless you scale it to your capacity because you can choose to start out with those smaller contributions that are straightforward or documentation, or you can come in and say, I really understand this content and I'm going to write 100 lines of code right now. Um, and that's just Wednesday. <laughs> you can really come in and choose which one that you want to be and the, make the experience yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. This conversation is making me think like, you know, if I want to start contributing more to open source, like I have to think of something, you know, maybe that I'm interested in and I love dogs. I'm just wondering if there's some kind of open source community that's just all about dogs that I could contribute something to. Now I'm going to have to look into it because <laughs> since it doesn't have to be code. <laughs> Yeah. You know what they say with with apps, there's an app for everything. There's literally like a project for everything. You go on GitHub, there are tons of readmes that have different open source projects on there. You know, hey, get started on this one or hey, you looking for this? Like these are a list of projects you can do. Um, there are tons of resources online. Um, my personal favorite is Dev.2. It's kind of crowdsourced articles um, and usually uh, writers or authors would post something and say, hey, look, this is how you get into open source. Here's some tips. Uh, here's some suggestions. Uh, Medium's also a good place or a good old fashioned Google search. Yeah. <laughs> Mansplaining. <laughs>
on mansplaining. Yeah, so mansplaining, you guys can define it a little bit better than me, but mansplaining is uh, explaining a concept, but yeah, explaining things like I'm five is a good thing if that's what the person wants. But if I ask a question about something technical, I don't need it automatically broken down like I'm five immediately. I don't need someone saying, oh, do you get that? Or, oh, do you understand this? Um, it is good to follow up to see if I'm tracking, but it's the tone. You know, it, you have to watch your tone in Slack messages, Discord messages, whatever messaging system that you're using. Sometimes even in code reviews, it could be a little demeaning, uh, whether it's the code review or the explanation. And most of the times, like I would say 95, 99% of the time, it's good intentions. It's not meant to harm. It's not meant to make you feel bad. But don't assume, you know, we don't know things. And vice versa, the other way around, like I should always ask my questions. I shouldn't feel like I should know everything. Um, but yeah, mansplaining, I think that is, that is, that's a big one for me. That mansplaining itself is one of the reasons I avoid asking questions sometimes. I love that you brought that up too, because I think sometimes people will just assume we don't know something without maybe asking, like, do you, do you know how to do this? Instead, just launch straight into, well, here's how you would do it, you know, and that brings up implicit bias. We all have implicit bias, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you see women who are, you know, if I say, I'm a software engineer, front end developer, whatever. Like, we don't need to be questioned on our credentials. We don't need someone to assume, like, well, are you really? Or do you, like, you know, I've been asked plenty of times, so you write code. And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> what do you think this means? You know, and that's, it's, it's just not cool. And I know maybe it's just from most of the time a place of confusion. You know, they're just not used to seeing women in the field. So it's like a sort of a knee jerk reaction. But it doesn't help us because, you know, it makes us kind of feel bad. Like, oh, now I'm questioning myself. Do I even belong here? Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, people within a community, as long as they just don't make any assumptions about anyone until, you know, maybe if they ask a question, assume then from their question, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when they just launch into a description of what something is without, like you said, asking. Uh, because they just assume they need to explain this to you without even giving you the benefit of the doubt that you actually understand what you're working on. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, one of the issues is when I will ask a question or if someone else asks a question that they might be female or any sort of minority um, and someone is asking, that doesn't make sense, that's not true. And then another someone in the field who's respected or looks more like them will come and say, no, that's right. And I have that experience as well. And suddenly they fully understand it um, without ever acknowledging that you might've said it first, you said the exact okay. same thing. And if they could have just said, oh, that was my mistake, that's what you meant, then that would clear everything up. So I, I think just acknowledging that you made a mistake is really important. Um, and, and a lot more welcoming to newcomers who may feel like, oh, I can't ask my question anymore because that just made me seem silly when it was really true. Mm -hmm. It's not like an intentional thing. It's maybe like their subconscious, like, oh, maybe she doesn't understand and I should come in here and, and explain it so they get it. Like, would you explain that to your male counterpart in that manner? Or would you say it, you know, as a matter of factly, like, you know, to him as you would to me? And I think that's a contributing factor to why a lot of people breaking into communities don't like to ask those questions because um, mm -hmm. they just feel like if they ask them, it's a detractor to themselves. Um, so you really just have to break out of that comfort zone and ask your questions and help and hope people learn from that and, and don't put you down because of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it gets better over time too. I've gotten a little more comfortable with asking questions and I've kind of paired it with like making fun of myself a little bit. like. I'm, I'll ask a question. I'm like, I know this is maybe not the best question and it's going to make me look dumb, but you know what? I'm struggling with it right now. We've all been here. So let's just, let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It just makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Like I'll admit like, Hey, I actually don't know this. Uh, please explain it to me in a way, you know, that that would be productive and I'd understand. And I think the phrasing that I've been trying something new lately is how I phrase my questions. So instead of saying like, this is a stupid question, I'll say something like, can you help remind me 
about yes. this topic <laughs> uh, because I do know it and I want to clarify that mm -hmm. we're on the same page about something. So I think the phrasing with how communities interact with each other and ask the questions is really important mm -hmm. helping to establish that. <laughs> kind of reminds me of like code review behavior. I know most projects have uh, community guidelines and look at suggestions on how to give a code review, uh, but I've had experiences before and I've had, I've known other people to have, like, women to have this experience before where they would get a code review comment and it just kind of, I don't know, the tone kind of made them feel bad, like you should know this. It didn't work verbatim say you should know this, but it came off as you should know this, why are you doing this? Um, I think writing um code review comments kind of put yourself in the shoe of the of of the committer as a reviewer uh, whether they're male or female and, and don't put people down you know with, within your written messages yeah just have tons of empathy and use smiley faces when necessary yeah or instead of challenging something like this is black and white you did this code wrong ask a clarifying question. So say something like in your code review, could you help me explain why you did this more or what's the logic behind this? Because that really gives them an opportunity to show you what their headspace is like and you're not putting them down, you're just gathering more information. So I, I think again, just changing the perspective like you were saying and the phrasing and the tone and it all comes together to be a more welcoming environment in that case. Yeah, personally, I like to say we in my code review comments, like if yeah, I see something that needs to be yeah. changed, maybe we should try this and then I'll provide maybe like an example or a link to documentation or something like that to make it more of a partnership versus a you made a mistake, fix this, this is wrong. Like we just makes it a little more gentle. Yeah, I love that, especially because it is a community and it's not just your code. Like if you're reviewing it, it's your code too. So you're working together and it's a we. Mm -hmm. our code. Yeah, there's no I in team. One. There are those who have a personality where they, you know, naturally take charge and lead within the call. And, and that's that's how they would operate in person. And sometimes it could be a little overpowering within meetings because uh, they may forget to pause between uh, comments. So one trick that I like, I'm not one of those people, I think, I hope, uh, but one, <laughs> one thing I like to try is, you know, count to five between a question or count to five before switching to another topic, because that creates a gap of time where someone else can chime in or someone else can raise their hand in the chat and contribute to the conversation. Um, muting mics too, That that, but that's another topic. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to read body language over a WebEx, you know, like if you're all sitting at a table, if you know, if I'm like, want to say something, I could just go like, you know, kind of put my finger up or something like that's a really good point and then just take it away. But you, it's kind of hard to do that on a WebEx like, so I don't know, I think, you know, as people, people who are speaking, it's kind of on them to make the change in this situation. I mean, maybe there are things that we can do, but over WebEx, it's going to be really hard for us to try to say like, hey, you know, I want to say something mm -hmm. almost impossible. I think it's almost been giving me more practice, like where I have to talk to my team virtually now. That's how I would normally communicate with an open source community because everyone is so widespread and in different time zones. So I almost feel more practiced and ready to jump into different communities because we've been doing it in our everyday life now. So I've, I've been thinking of it as an opportunity um, to gain more insight in how I can communicate better with outside communities because I'm having to do it in my natural everyday working community. I really like what you said, Brittany. Uh, it really resonates with me. I feel like now that we are working from home, we've gone digital, we really have to be intentional about our communication. Um, mm -hmm. There's, You can't just assume something's going to happen. You can't assume somebody's going to uh, understand something. You need to clar ask clarifying questions, summarize at the end of the call, maybe rephrase somebody's question to make sure you're get, you understood what was being asked before you answer it. Um, I feel like these are soft skills that are, are just, I don't know, they're being amplified now. Um, before in the office, I feel like we didn't have to try it as hard, but now it's purely intentional. Yeah, I yeah, just I feel, feel like it's strange. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, I feel strange just like sitting in front of my laptop like this all day, like, like I wanna like 
be around people like in person. It's just so much more, it's a little draining, you know, being on mm -hmm. WebEx calls all day. And I don't know what it is exactly, but you know, it, it does revamp me a little bit when I see somebody's dog in the background or cat or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is going to be a good call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, cameras on too. There, it's okay not to be camera ready. Five times out of ten, I'm not camera ready. Uh, morning meetings before I had my coffee, definitely not camera ready. But <laughs> seeing a face, um, adding a face to a voice, especially when you're on larger calls uh, with other community members, it, it just adds that little bit of a personal touch that keeps you connected to the call. Um, Personally, if I'm in a meeting with 10 other people, nobody has their cameras on, I'm kind of like, I kind of lose focus a little bit and I kind of don't feel as connected to the conversation. But if everyone has their cam cameras on, I could see your facial expressions. I could see your reactions. Like if I say something and you go, Ugh, then I know maybe I need to, you know, throttle back and, and revisit something. So cameras on sometimes. You mentioned seeing people and establishing those connections and like keeping you engaged. It brings me to when I was joining an open source community, I didn't know who was in the community. I've seen some names on emails, but that was it. So it was kind of hard to actually throw myself into it when I didn't feel a connection with anyone. And I thought, oh, what are people going to see when they see my name? So I went to you know my GitHub profile and it just had my name. And so I'm thinking, OK, I should put a bio or a blurb here, some pictures. Um, that way people know, you know, this is who is Brittany when I see that name coming through the community. And so I started going through and looking up different people. So I think one of the things I would recommend is getting familiar with the other people in the community, even if it feels weird, um, or maybe sending out a blurb on, hey, I want to join this community and this is why, here's a couple of my interests, because then people will be able to say, okay, that's cool, I have that same interest, and maybe you could establish like a mentor relationship there because I threw out, I like to do 3D printing um, in one of my blurbs and someone actually reached out and they're like, I do too. And so we were able to chat about that. And then I would say, do you have any new code ideas? You know, and then we could bounce off each other that way. And it was a really good segue into the community that I otherwise wouldn't have thought of. Um, and it kind of really helped me lower my anxiety barriers to even asking questions going back to what we were talking about before, because, you know, I knew a name or if I wanted to run something by them first. I think having those friendships really helps you. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to ask a question to a person versus asking a question to a screen name on the computer. You know? Yes, <laughs> sending it out to the newsletter and you're like, oh, who's going to get this? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I I remember both of y'all's animals now, like your dog and your cat over here. Like, <laughs> I love that. You know, just seeing somebody's name in an email, I am not going to remember anything, you know, about like whatever. But, you know, just actually having that human element, the human connection on calls. I love that idea. Yeah, we're, we're all humans, you know, no matter how digital we get or how, um, you know, virtually disconnected we are, we still crave personal interactions and personal connections. Um, I feel like teams are more cohesive with those personal connections. Um, like you said, be it a garden or a pet or, you know, right now you guys are in my home. <laughs> I'm in your homes. Yeah. <laughs> how personal, how much more personal can we get? Um, if you send me an email versus somebody I don't have a face to the name to, I'm probably going to reply to your email first. I mean, depending on what the email is about. But, you know, personal connections are really important. We as humans will probably go the extra mile if we feel connected to somebody. Um, everyone should feel comfortable. You know, if you want to see a change, make that suggestion, even if it feels weird. Um, when I joined my team, they were doing retrospectives once a year. And I didn't think that's enough. You know, it kind of felt like, OK, once a year, what can you even remember from January? So I suggested let's do it every quarter. Um, and at first I, I didn't get a lot of um, everyone speaking up, but and I was starting to worry, OK, maybe they don't like this. It's getting annoying. And I decided to ask for a poll and it was actually really successful. They're like, no, we want to keep doing this. It's been working well for us and we like having that time to talk to everyone. Um, so I had got it in my head that I was annoying them with this new suggestion, <laughs> but it was actually something that was really positive. So mm -hmm. just break out of your comfort zone a little bit. Don't feel like this is something I want to do. They won't do it. 
um, you should just really try it and it could be worth it. Yeah, retrospectives are real like that's a relationship building, trust building exercise if you think about it, because everybody is kind of making themselves vulnerable by expressing, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what they would like to change. And it does take a little bit of courage to bring it up, especially when you are newer on a project or, you know, not too familiar with, with processes. Um, but retros are very, very important. Uh, on my team, we do this really neat thing we have retros every two weeks, by the way. We, we have a lot of retros. <laughs> uh, but we do nice. this really neat thing where um, our lead will have these little sm emojis on the screen and you drag a smiley face or like a meh face or like a, uh, a stabby face. And so we start the retro with putting those emojis there to say how each of us felt anonymously about our sprint. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we have all happies, we know we had a good sprint. We have a couple of meds like, oh, maybe something needs to be revisited. And stabbies, whoa, uh, something went wrong. <laughs> we need changes, absolutely. And just kind of seeing those, um, it, it's like a temperature check almost, and we could mm -hmm. see how everybody felt. And it kind of opens up that conversation where everybody can feel comfortable in, in giving suggestions or giving feedback. Yeah, I love that. I think it adds a fun aspect to it. And I know GitHub has started adding emojis to pull requests. So I love that where I can add like the thumbs up or the sad face. If I see like you didn't update the copyright sad face, <laughs> please update that. <laughs> so I think adding that fun aspect, um, it, it definitely helps change the tone and make it welcoming. Mm -hmm. Can't underestimate the value of a good emoji, you know, a little explosion. <laughs> 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 the flame for like, wow, you did good. <laughs> We have um, here at IBM like a TJ bot where you put a Raspberry Pi and it's little you can 3D print it or put it, make it out of cardboard. And it's just a little robot that like moves his arm and he can has a little light and he could do stuff. I really would like to see a 3D printed version of the TJ doggy. So there's like a little dog version <laughs> that's on like my to do fun list. I've not gotten around to it, but if I could do that in the next five years, if that's my legacy, Morgan made the <laughs> 3D printed TJ doggy then I could die happy. <laughs> That's awesome. I would want a cat version. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much untapped talent out there. Um, you know, you have HBCUs with all, super technical graduates with all this experience and all this knowledge that's that's just ready to to be out there um you know high schools inner city high schools with with tons of kids who have the potential uh who haven't necessarily been given the opportunity because of you know maybe they can't get to the tech computer summer camp uh, maybe they don't have money mm -hmm. to go to after school tutoring or maybe they don't have wi-fi at home but yeah, I think that would be my legacy. I, I'd want to give back to my community, go back into schools and, and kind of encourage those who think they can't do it and let them know that they can um, and then just help provide some of those tools. I think mine's very similar to that, just like you said, Dixie, where I do come from a rural area and we didn't see many women in those fields and we didn't have that many opportunities. Um, so I think just reaching out, like you said, to the community and continuing to do some of the work that I'm involved in with IBM, where we go to the local middle schools, um, we invite them to see our campus and to follow that path and to actually see some of those girls that I've worked with at the Girl Scout camps and the local schools actually come and join and work for us at IBM. I would love to still be working at IBM and see them join in and maybe have a mentor program with them. I think that would be so awesome to have a full circle. Hi, everybody. 
I hope, can you hear me? Is my mic on? I hope you guys enjoyed our yep. TED talk. <laughs> it was really fun putting that together. Um, we got to know each other a lot and talk about our different experiences and it was super fun. Um, so we have a few minutes now. We'd like to open up the floor for any Q&A. Um, if you have questions, you can type it in the chat or feel free to you know, uh, ping us individually. I've actually got a question for you, Dixie. Um, if you wanted, and this is something like we hear from people all the time, if you had to make any recommendations for places, excuse me, places for people to get involved directly in open source, if they're like, I want to do it, but I don't know where to start. Do you have any projects or programs specifically that you could recommend? So I know me personally, I got started um, with development camp and after my boot camp i felt really insecure about my skills and i was like oh, i don't know where to go what to do and october rolled around and there was this event called hacktoberfest uh which basically uh if you haven't heard about it it is um this event that encourages everyone to contribute to open source um and several projects throughout github will have a hacktoberfest tag associated with some of their issues um, you can filter by Hectoberfest. You can find good first issues to start with. Uh, and so that's how I started. I hopped on there, started looking at some of those tags and found um, some documentation um, changes that I could make. And my very first open source contribution was Spanish translations on an app called Code Combat, which teaches kids how to code. Uh, and it was super exciting when my pull request was finally merged and I saw my name there as a contributor and I was like, oh, I can code, I'm a contributor, I, I'm a developer, I'm an open source person. Um, so yeah, Hacktoberfest is one way to start. I'm really obsessed with this. I remember when you first told us about it that you did the translations, I would have never thought of that. Like I'm always thinking like, all right, I need to create a button for some kind of application. Or you know, for me, my first thing was just like updating the documentation, but doing translations, that's kind of awesome. Oh, I guess another good place for people to look, this is actually how I got started, is internal, um, internally to your company. So here at IBM, we have a developer jumpstart program for new hires, and it basically kind of shows us as, you know, if you're fresh out of college and you're just starting as a developer, you go through all these different events and stuff, and they just teach you a lot of really cool things, and you make a lot of friends. Um, so that's how I got started. They actually had an open source cohort, as they called us, and they taught us, like, here's what open source is, here's how to get started contributing. And they paired us up with mentors and our mentors actually like helped, they, they literally like held our hand and walked us through the whole process, which was really cool. Cause I was really intimidated by it. I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, but he was like, no, no, look, it's let, let's look for some documentation, like something easy like that to start with. And then sure enough, you know, he walked me through the whole thing and that was a really good place to start. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you bring up that program. Uh, I actually mentored in that program uh, earlier this year for the very first time. Uh, it was one of my first mentorship experiences where I was the mentor, not the mentee. Uh, and it was a really good learning experience because I took myself out of out of the shoe of the committer and I'm in the shoe of, of the person guiding. Uh, and it was kind of eye opening to see things that, you know, we kind of assume everybody should know because we know it and you have to really stop and think and say, okay, um, where do we start? How do we start together? How, how do we gauge where we're at? Um, and I think when you get started with open source, a lot of people want to jump in there and change the world with their very first commit and drop like some extra large change, new feature. Uh, we don't have to do that. Like you can come in there and start with something really, really small, get your toes wet. Um, documentation change is small, uh, tiny bug fixes are small. Um, always look for that good first issue tag. Uh, and as mentors and as open source community members, make sure you're using those tags well too, because someone might be looking at your project. Um, they might want to contribute and all they see are these huge, huge, huge issues and they might get overwhelmed and not want to contribute. Um, so always think in both perspectives, as a new person, as an experienced person, how can I contribute to this community positively? Yeah, it's like the ultimate empathy test. Like you have to figure out like, what exactly is this other person gonna be thinking you're looking for? Um, and that's a really good point about the tags too. You know, as a new contributor, you that's what you wanna go look for are the tags, but also as people who are established in the communities, we need to make sure that we're actually adding these 
you know, maybe simpler issues if I think like, oh, this, you know, this title needs to be updated, but eh, I don't want to, I'll just go do it. You know, maybe just leave it open for somebody else. That's, that's a good end point for them. With mentoring, it's also, uh, I know we talked about documentation a lot, but it's also an, an eye-opening opportunity where we see where we might have gaps because when you're in a project and you're contributing, you get into this rhythm and flow and you know what to do. But if you hand over the baton to somebody else, they might not necessarily hit the ground running right away and they might need a little bit more guidance with, you know, patterns, um, consistency issues, uh, uh Decisions that were made in meetings and stuff that might have not been documented, those things should be documented. So, yeah, that that's uh, another little tidbit that I could share with mentoring. You almost need documentation for the documentation. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the audience? Thank you guys so much for, for joining us, by the way, if I didn't mention that already. <laughs> yeah, this has been great. I think um, I think our time is almost up, actually. So, um, any parting words, Dixie? Um, I don't know. I have a lot of words sometimes, and <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess you know that. Yeah, with having a lot of words, um, always feel don't feel like your voice doesn't matter. Your voice does matter. Your questions do matter. Uh, if you have a question, somebody else has the same exact question either now or down the line. Um, don't feel discouraged and every contribution is a positive contribution. Uh, whether it's learning, personal learning for you, learning for the community, a contribution to the project, uh, everything is positive and, and you know, we want it. Actually, and I just saw a question come in the chat here, which is a really good question. Do you consider open source as the hidden gold mine for students? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's a great platform, you know, to, to, to get some experience. So let's say somebody who's a bootcamp grad, um, they don't really have any real world projects that they've hopped on yet. This is a great opportunity for them to build their resume. Uh, high school students who are trying to build some of their experience, um, that this is a great way for them to do it as well because uh, it's teaching them communication, it's teaching them programming, engineering, uh, community building. It, it's just a really well-rounded experience. And as far as the like, younger grades, Possibly, um, there could be projects that are appropriate for younger grades, and that's—I think—that's an area I'd love to explore. Yeah, I know they have tons of like robotics projects for you know, like elementary or junior high level students. Um, and I'm glad that that you brought this up um, because, as Brittany mentioned earlier, you know, she's from a rural area, and I am too. So in these smaller schools, we typically don't have like computer science or programming classes or whatever, you know, back in high school. Um, so open source is a really good place if you if you want to learn this stuff. And I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we had dial up, so you couldn't really go on the internet and watch videos to learn how to do stuff. But nowadays, you know, and for fear of aging myself here, um, you definitely can. You could just go and you could kind of teach yourself how to code and it doesn't have to be anything extravagant, but um, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, you're like, yeah, I want to learn how to do this. You've got access to the internet, but maybe you don't know people around you. Um, open source is a really good place to get started. Now that you bring up that you're from a rural town, um, that goes for almost any town. Sometimes it's hard to find a mentor in your immediate community. Uh, I know when I was in school, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me who were going into engineering. And that was very discouraging for me personally. Like I felt like I didn't belong. Uh, but being an open source, your world went from like this to this. Uh, you, you have a whole entire global community where you can work with people from different cultures, ethnicities, countries, you name it. Uh, and you can find a mentor to work with and learn and grow with. Um, I see another question here. Can you recommend tools to find help wanted issues? Um, this person found open source help wanted site and found some lists, but before, so, um, I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I know we're supposed to end in one minute. Um, I would say in general, just, you know, if you kind of do a quick Google search of open source projects and then find a topic that you're interested in, and then from there, look for the help wanted tags. Uh, it's probably the best place to do, uh, to go. Within GitHub, I think if you type in the search help wanted, it'll show a bunch of issues that have that tag and you'll just have to scan all the, all the projects. There you go. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's all our right. time. Um, Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, feel free to look me up or us up on LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, wherever you uh, get your social media. And um, as the game show host said, don't forget to spay and neuter your pets. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>